Hey folks, don't mind the filming background today. I am currently in the garage filming because I still don't have a suitable filming location, so I hope you don't mind. I'm also trying out a tripod for filming, finally. But this one seems to fit my camera, so we'll see how long it lasts because it feels kind of cheap and flimsy, but I just don't want to jinx it. Anyway, so today I want to talk about the computer that is in front of you. And, well, the reason why I'm filming it in its current condition is because it's sort of a revision one, if you will, of what I'm trying to put together. It's a passion project of mine that I've always wanted to do and for no other reason that I can. So I thought I would try to document at least a little bit of its journey into becoming what I would like it to be. So stay tuned and we'll talk about it. So the Ugly Duckling computer that is sitting in front of your screen right now is revision one of what I would consider to be my ultimate Windows XP computer, or perhaps even the ultimate Windows XP computer. The whole purpose of this machine, at least as soon as it's done, is to make something that will run virtually everything that is designed for Windows XP, or at least within the compatibility scope of the operating system, and to be able to do it with the highest possible performance, at least maybe performance per dollar even, and to really make something that I can pull off the shelf in any given amount of time and run anything that is compatible for Windows XP, it, within reason, of course. Now, the initial goal to start out with, just because of hardware pricing right now, is to make something that is relatively cost to performance efficient. Now, really, this project as a whole, you know, it's not probably the most cost efficient way to go about building an ultimate Windows XP computer. And the reason why I talk about it that way is because the aspect of an ultimate Windows XP computer, of course, is very figurative and it's up to you what you think is going to be your dream Windows XP machine. And you can pick the components that you feel make it your ultimate Windows XP computer. But really for me, I mean, this hardware that's all in here currently officially will have driver support for XP, both its 32-bit and 64-bit iterations. And there's no weird hardware or software trickery going on here to make this stuff actually work. In due time, that will actually start to bend a bit. I will have to hack on video drivers, and perhaps in the future, maybe there might be some other hardware drivers or software tricks I'm gonna to put together to really make this thing the ultimate Windows XP machine to get the best possible performance uh, value be damned, <laughs> basically. And so I'm starting out to test things and to see where I want to take the project and to try out whether I can upgrade the platform any farther than I already have it. And right now, that's already pretty damn ultimate, and it's got quite the assortment of high-end components uh, from the 2010s, specifically, to make this machine perform at its best. Now, like a lot of hardware I show on this channel or pick up for myself, I usually pick it up used. So in this case, this particular chassis with the motherboard and processor and memory and storage and power supply that you see in front of you, excluding the graphics card, I all picked up recently from a Facebook Marketplace deal. Uh, There's a seller that cut me a pretty good deal. We did a partial cash trade on it. So I know I don't think I did too badly there. Obviously, I'm not going to share specifics, but you know, you can pretty much figure the rest out for yourself in your head. Now, the machine, when I got it, was designed to be some kind of an entry-level-ish kind of gaming machine, maybe something mid-range. Now, the CPU uh, memory, the motherboard, and the storage, as well as the power supply and the case that it's currently sitting in, all work together, and they were actually originally paired with this video card here, which is an EVGA for the Win 2 GeForce GTX 1070 Ti. A great graphics card, don't get me wrong, especially a very, very well-built one by EVGA, as they usually made high-quality products. But, alas, that would not do for Windows XP. So, I had to, in this case, downgrade the graphics card. Now, this was mainly just as a filler, because I was holding out for something a lot better, which will soon be in the mail. That's why I'm actually filming this video now, as a revision one kind of an origins video to show my starting point and to see where it eventually will take off from. Now, if you don't mind a bit of rambling, I would like to actually talk about the true origins of the Ultimate Windows XP PC. 
Now, the machine that you see to your left that has been put in the frame was never meant to be a permanent machine. It was initially just my Revision Zero, kind of an alpha test bench, if you will. It's a socket 1156 Intel platform with a first gen Core i5, which in and of itself is really already kind of overkill for Windows XP and what I would want to do with it. It already has pretty great IPC. I have eight gigabytes of RAM, which is already plenty if you're running XPX 64 edition. And it would work with my graphics cards that I'd want to put in. And well, it was pretty much already ready to go. It had all the drivers that you needed. It has USB 3 support. What more could I want? Well, here's the thing. Ultimate XP machines, like I mentioned, are kind of relative. You pick what you want, what you want your dream hardware to be, or what you can afford. And, you know, since I had the ability to go higher, well, why stop at first gen? Well, like I mentioned, it was a, just a test bench to see if this would actually work, to see if I could make my dream come true in that sense. And this did an admirable job, this first gen system, don't get me wrong. It did beautifully and it ran everything I wanted it to do without question. But there's a couple of things that are driving me away. And these are easily remediable. I'm not gonna say that I couldn't obviously fix this first gen system to work, but well, first of which, the clock speed of the processor that is in this first gen system currently is not ideal. Now I use this example here for Grand Theft Auto 4 on Windows XP. And I say this because of the fact that uh, the, the game was a direct port or not really maybe a direct port, well, I think it was from the Xbox 360. Obviously correct me down below in the comments section if I'm wrong on that, but I believe it was. With that, there was always this looming overhead that the game expected a 3.2 gigahertz CPU clock speed in order to run in an ideal scenario. This i5 is the 750. This is not a bad processor. It's a four core, four thread CPU from 2010-ish, and it has a clock speed of 2.66 gigahertz. Now that can turbo boost, and that is supported under Windows XP. However, that's not really ideal. And I did notice that the game had some problems with stuttering as a result of that lower clock speed. This is just an inherent thing with GTA 4, and it's something that you just have to buy better hardware for. So since GTA 4 is one of those games that I would like to play on the Ultimate XP machine, or to benchmark hardware with on the Ultimate XP machine, well, alas, I needed something with a better clock speed. The core count doesn't necessarily matter too much as long as you had a really nice dual core processor. And in fact, you could actually get away with a Core 2 Duo E8600 or maybe an E8500 for the job, since they're pretty much going to be about the best of the best. And you could also probably get away with something on the AMD front that clocks that high, something like a Phantom 2. So why would I need to go any higher than that? Well, there's also some other things. Um, obviously, there's mixed hardware support in the case of 1156. You're not always guaranteed to get four RAM slots or nice PCI Express expandability, USB 3, and etc. etc. Now, the ASUS motherboard in this machine, I believe, is an H57 chipset, which is already pretty good. It has a lot of features in it. it even has USB 3.0 on board, which is fully supported under Windows XP. So, it's, it's a nice machine, it really is. But I want the best CPU performance that I could possibly get, the best graphics performance that I could possibly afford within reasonable means. And to be able to have a machine that can just literally scream through anything you run on this. So yeah, the first gen system, while good, and it would make a great, great Ultimate XP machine for somebody with the right hardware, it wasn't for me. And like I said at the start of the section, it was really only meant to be a test bench for me to test games, with this GPU that I now currently have in here, which I'm likely going to repurpose after I get the new hardware in the mail this week as of the making of this video. And I don't know if it's gonna go back into this machine, probably not, I think I'll have another use for that GPU, but well, I guess without further ado, let me talk about what is actually stored inside of the revision one of my Ultimate Windows XP computer. So when you're trying to build an Ultimate Windows XP computer, you want to have the best underlying platform. Two of some of the best that you can get for Windows XP include Intel's Z77 and X79. I believe those are the two newest chipsets that you can get for official, anyway, 
Windows XP supported. Now, if I'm not mistaken, X99 is a bit too new as that one uses Haswell E and well, that might be pushing it a bit. I actually don't know if those would actually support Windows XP, even with unofficial drivers. I know for a fact that you can get Z97 support in Windows XP, and you can use Haswell processors, and especially including the Core i7-4770K. And ideally, I could go for something like that, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. In fact, I might even go down that route, if nothing else. But I figured a good starting platform, since it was locally available, was Z77. And inside this machine is one of the best Z77 compatible processors that you can buy. And one of the most well-known and most well-loved, the i7-3770K. And this chip is excellent. It's 3.5 gigahertz base clock. It has four cores and eight threads and has a very great IPC for XP. This chip is truly one of the best that you can use for the platform. Now, like I mentioned, you can go with Z97. Those in certain cases will actually have XP support, both 32-bit and 64-bit. So like I said, you can do better, but this is a great start point for revision one. You really cannot go wrong with a 3770K. Likewise, if you wanted to save a little bit more money, you could go down the route of Sandy Bridge. And you can, in that case, I believe the chipset, I'm not sure which one it was exactly. I know it's like, maybe you could do like Q67. I think there was a Z chip set that was in that series, like the 60 series. Obviously you guys would have better hardware knowledge than I do, but you could definitely go down the route of an i7-2600K, which would also do the job very well. It's just Ivy Bridge has a little bit more IPC and it has a lot more DDR3 memory speed compatibility. Speaking of the memory in this particular machine, as you can see, all four slots of this Asus Sabertooth Z77 motherboard are filled. This has, I believe, a G-Scale Ares kit of 16 gigabytes of DDR3 memory, which is operated to run at 2133 megahertz. Yes, 2133 megahertz. A bit overkill for DDR3, but that's how I bought the machine. I am far from complaining. I would have been totally fine even if it was 1600 megahertz or even 1333. Having DDR3 is already extremely overkill for Windows XP performance. And just having it at 2133 megahertz makes it truly all the better and just makes it to where you have the best performance. As far as I'm aware, there are no DDR4 platforms that have support for XP. So as I mentioned, things like X99 will not work to my knowledge. So that's unfortunate. I think Z97 was completely DDR3 only. So I, I could be wrong on that, but I believe those were all DDR3 only. It wasn't until you got to like, was it Z170, where they started giving you the choice of DDR3 or DDR4 support. But then you're into Skylake uh, territory, and at that point, it's really not worth even considering that for Windows XP. You're not gonna have a very good time. As far as storage goes, really you could use any modern hard drive. It's gonna be a very fast drive in comparison to what would have been back in the day for Windows XP use, uh, especially if you're on serial ATA, which for an ultimate XP machine, I would expect that to be the case. And of course in here, there's no exception despite the loose dangling red SATA cable there. This has a 512 gigabyte SATA 3 SSD in there. That's again, what I bought the computer with and it is extremely overkill for XP, I'm well aware. Now, one thing I would like to do later on, I would like to actually swap out the SSD for something that would be more XP era appropriate. And then obviously for mass storage, I would like to get myself a two terabyte hard drive. Now, two terabytes is a specific number to point out because obviously XP will not work with the GUID partition table or GPT. So you're actually stuck using MBR. And in MBR systems, the actual theoretical max limitation is two terabytes for storage of a single drive. And of course, that's just within the partition limits, which I think you get like up to three partitions on an MBR disk. That's just inherently how it is. So that's what I would like to do is to have an ultra fast boot drive which I might go with a Samsung SSD since you can get a version of the Samsung Magician software for Windows XP to do things like trim and other SSD maintenance. So that would be something I would love to do. So later on, that would be a dream goal of mine. But for right now, the one that's in there, I believe it's a team group SSD. 
Should do the trick just fine. It's totally overkill again for XP, but it will do. Now, when it comes to video cards, well, this machine has definitely a no exception video card. It's still a great option if you want something that'll be in your ultimate Windows XP machine. Now, what I have here is a Zotac GTX 780. This is the amp edition of the card, which was a factory overclocked edition of the card. I don't remember exactly to how much this is overclocked from a standard spec 780, but it definitely has more clock speed and it has a fairly large cooler to boot. I believe this card has a TDP of around give or take 200 to 250 watts. It was a flagship card from 2013, so it's to no surprise that it needs an 8 and a 6-pin power connector, as well as a power supply requirement of around 600 watts, which this machine most certainly meets that requirement. Now, really when it comes to XP video cards, you have a lot of excellent choices, but unfortunately it's one of those things where AMD at the time, even though they had fantastic hardware, their drivers and the whole fine wine aspect had not been fully brought uh, to fruition. And unfortunately, the last drivers that are available for Windows XP, while they work, you're not going to really get the best possible performance out of your games. They'll at least start up and run, don't get me wrong, but you're not really going to get the best possible performance. So, you know, NVIDIA is the way to go with XP in mind. And you can obviously do a lot better than this. In fact, I plan to do that in the distant future once prices of cards continues to drop. I have no reason to buy them otherwise besides this project, so I'm really not in a rush. Now, the GTX 780, you might be thinking, well, gee whiz, that's really an overkill card. It's got three gigs of GDDR5, and the thing has already got a lot of horsepower for XP, and especially DX9, DX10, DX11 games, if you choose to install Vista or 7 or even Windows 10. So why would you need more? Well, See, here's the thing, uh, a lot of people probably don't remember this, but NVIDIA actually has drivers for their Maxwell series of cards, which is the 900 series, and for that matter, the 750 and 750 Ti. Those will all run on Windows XP as well. However, to keep in mind that there's a kind of an asterisk point to that. Now, NVIDIA officially supported the GTX 950 and 960, as well as, again, the 745, 750, and 750 Ti on XP. Now, that's great and all, because those are all Maxwell cards. However, unfortunately, the 970 and up, including the Titan X and the Quadro M6000 and its 24 gigabyte counterpart, are unfortunately kind of left in the dust. So, uh, maybe with the exception of the 24 gig M6000, I believe you can hack the newest officially available Maxwell driver, which I believe in XP's case is 368.81. I could be wrong, there might be a newer version, but you can actually add back in the official hardware IDs from the driver versions that superseded it and put them in, and you can restore that functionality to install the official NVIDIA control panel, the drivers and all that stuff for 970, 980, 980 Ti, Titan X, and Quadro M6000 back into the driver. And then you'll actually have a perfectly functional Maxwell card that isn't a 745, 750, 750 Ti, 950, or 960. I mean, that's obviously up to you if you want to do that. Obviously, 960 is a great card for XP, but if you truly want the best of the best, you're going to have to unfortunately hack the drivers unless you want to stick to something like the original GTX Titan or Titan Black. Now, I don't remember the exact model of this Cooler Master case, but not like it matters anyway. I don't think I'm actually going to keep it for this particular build. Okay, I'll keep the case because it actually makes for a pretty good test bench case. And eventually what I'd like to do is build my AM5 test bench into this machine because of the fact that it has, well, no side panel to get in the way and it has some large 200 millimeter intake fans there and probably what i do is i just make something out of like cardboard or maybe if i was really fancy i'll email cooler master support and i'll get a replacement tempered glass side panel but eh, well maybe if i feel like i'm up to the task but what i'd like to do for the ultimate xp machine is i would like to have something that well obviously has a side panel on it but it's also going to have support for something well ideally two but that won't ever happen with at least this platform uh, options inside the case. 
well, biggest one being a DVD drive. I kind of need a DVD drive for the vast majority of the things that I would like to install on XP, a lot of which was on optical media. That's just a no surprise. Uh, internet was available in broadband form throughout XP's lifespan, but obviously bandwidth for many people at the time, especially download bandwidth, was in the single digits, which was still pretty damn fast in comparison to dial-up, don't get me wrong, but well, obviously people still needed to do bulk program and game installs from disk. That was just the reality of it back in the day. It was just much easier to distribute it that way. Yes, there was Steam, and technically speaking, there were some other platforms back in the day too that eventually evolved and were also still compatible with Windows XP, but obviously again, it depended on the internet, so a lot of things still relied on the form of DVD for many, many people and their hardware. So that would be something I would like to have is a DVD burner because, well, there might also be the chances that I need to use Image Burn to burn a DVD or a CD. And so I don't have to always dig out my other XP machine that has a floppy drive in it in order to do the task. Although I'd still obviously use that machine for the needs of a floppy disk drive, which has a Pentium 4 and it's plenty fast enough to do the job. So in any case, that is something that I would like to have is something with an optical drive. And that means, well, I mean, one of two things. I could build this into a sleeper case from the 90s or 2000s, or maybe even in the 2010s if I really cared, and to get something that would have an optical drive bay. That's not really that hard. But I want it to be a new case, potentially, if possible, although I don't mind a clean used example. But the thing with the used case, especially an older case, would be airflow. There's several hundred watts of thermal uh, capable energy that's going to be floating around in this case and so I need it to be exhausted not bake the whole computer that would not be good especially considering the fact that a lot of this hardware is going to start getting really hard to come by at least for an affordable price in the not too distant future so I'd like to at least maintain what I have as long as I can so that pretty much leaves me with getting something new and hopefully trying to find something that has an optical drive bay so I could stick to an older design or I could get something modern that just so happens to still have support for a DVD drive. And those things do exist. One notable example I can think of is the Fractal Design Pop Air. That case actually still has support for a DVD drive. And I might actually pick one of those up for this machine. I love the way it looks. I love the colors and it has support for a DVD drive bay. And perhaps what I could also do is the other thing, which I didn't mention, kind of need a floppy drive. Because of course, it wouldn't be in UXW build terms, a real computer if it didn't have a floppy drive. Now, what I'll probably have to do as a substitute is one of those, I think they make them like a USB internal header that plugs into one of the uh, little headers that sits on your motherboard and then it emulates a floppy drive on a custom PCB. And I might do that too. I can always get one of those uh, three and a half inch to five and a quarter inch filler plates from eBay. And then I could put that in and have a floppy drive. But I'll figure that out once the time allows, because of course that is something that I'll have to wait on getting a proper modded case for. And I'll probably repurpose the one that I have here. It's not a bad case. In fact, it actually is really good for airflow. It has dual 200 mil fans on the front. And if I was really daring enough, I could email Corsair customer support and I could order a replacement tempered glass side panel. And maybe I'll go down that route if I was really feeling adventurous enough. I'd like to actually transplant my AM5 build into this case because it's obviously very airflow oriented. So even if I don't get the tempered glass side panel, it'd be good for my test bench stuff for when I'm testing graphics cards and games. I'd like to have something that makes it a little easier to swap out the hardware for. So yeah, that'll be pretty nice. So in any, in any regard, um, yeah. <laughs> so hopefully that's at least a suitable enough introduction. This is revision one of the Ultimate XP machine and it's glory. It looks ugly, but it's got all the hardware that counts. And in the future, I'm gonna pretty it up and give it really the features that it deserves. Like I mentioned, a DVD drive, good airflow, and I'm gonna give it a better video card. And perhaps maybe if I really feel lucky enough, I will upgrade the underlying platform to something that supports Haswell, which is the, I believe, final uh, platform that will work with Windows XP officially anyway, without hacking on drivers and doing a bunch of other BSery. So why don't you say we power it on and give it a test.
<laughs> I am gonna have to fix the CMOS battery being dead, but I will figure that out later on because, well, I don't think it's gonna directly stop me from demonstrating the computer today. It just means that every single time I gotta boot this thing up after I'm plugging it, I gotta, well, fix the settings. So let's just do that real quickly here. So let's see. <laughs> For some reason this part takes a while, but then once it starts loading like it just did right there, then it starts literally flying, like this thing is an absolute trooper. And then, boom, there we are at the welcome screen. So, yeah, the BIOS and the fact that it has to sit through like five cycles of the progress bar before it starts booting is not exactly the most ideal, so... Yeah, whatever, right? <laughs> but it still boots up way faster than XP probably normally would on a hard drive. But I could be wrong. There could be some really fast XP builds on a hard drive. Of course, this wouldn't be a Windows XP video without playing the iconic startup sound. <laughs> and yes, the thing quite literally logs in in an instant. As soon as you hit the enter button, it's like, boom, there you go. There's the desktop. The thing is immediately in and yeah, it's a lot of rough patches right now as far as the desktop is concerned. I have a lot of crap on it, so yeah, forgive the mess. It's a bit out of uh, order, <laughs> but in time, I'll eventually get that sorted out. That's no big deal. So as you can see, just to reiterate the basics, it's got an i7-3770K with 16 gigs of RAM. It's running XP Pro X64 Edition, and as you can see, I have absolutely no question marks in device manager, which is excellent. So yes, this machine actually supports pretty much this whole entire system without any problems. And soon the graphics card I'm gonna have coming in will just make it even better. So that's awesome to hear and see and well soon to well get going. So I'm gonna open MSI Afterburner here, which isn't thrilled about not being able to update, but there's nothing I can really do about that because well, Afterburner, I think 4.6.2 was like the last stable version that runs on Windows XP, at least from my testing. I tried 4.6.3 and it doesn't seem to quite work right. I don't know what it is, but it just doesn't really quite work the way that it should. It's really weird. Anyway, uh, the Zotac card actually has a lot of nice control on it. And as you can see, I can control the power limit, the temperature limit, and I can overclock the card and do manual fan control, which is actually quite nice. This is, like I said, a Zotac card, not an MSI card, but it works pretty well. So. Heck yeah, this is pretty nice. Now, I mean, XP can play a ton of games, and not the least of which is one of my favorites. Let me see if I can find it here on the desktop. Here we go. I can play Zuma and continue my save game here, which this mouse has not got the most sensitivity on it, but hey, there we go. I can play Zuma. So, here we go. Oh, that was a bad move. <laughs> I'm already off to a great start here. Got this volume down for one thing. Yeah, this isn't really anything that this machine couldn't do, or really any Windows XP computer couldn't do. I mean, Zoom was really not that hard of a game to run. It came out in 2003, so, whoops, I'm just playing awfully at this angle. So, normally I play way better than this, and I'm also starting out at, like, level 6, so <laughs> that also doesn't help matters any. But yeah. This is something that works. Oh, hey, I got a life. That's cool. Anyways, you didn't come here to see Zuma, obviously. But there's some other games in here that I've been trying to get working, uh, one of which was Need for Speed Carbon. But unfortunately, I've run into a problem with these no CD patches online. I don't know if it's just Windows XP X64 edition, but in this case, I can't get Need for Speed Carbon to work because it's missing lc map string x in kernel 32.dll so i don't know if that's something to do with the wow 64 emulator that's an xpx 64 edition or if my no cd patch is bust or if my game edition is bust i really couldn't say i guess i'll have to keep searching um, obviously i need a dvd drive because i can't play gta san andreas second edition at least my copy of it without the cd or in this case a dvd so I need a DVD drive for that, but I might just find a no CD patch for that as well. So not a big deal, just kind of a minor annoyance. But then there's some other games that I've found so far that are actually a lot of fun and they don't require the use of Steam. Like for example, uh, Portal, which I'll actually open up here because I got it mistaken because I was trying to find the shortcut, but it's in my case currently still got the Half-Life 2 icon. 
So then here we go. Here's portal that opens up and now I can play portal on this machine and I don't have to worry about Steam. Now granted, I'm not gonna get to access any multiplayer or maps or anything like that without having to add that stuff in manually, but heck, that's totally fine. So let me just go in here. I obviously have to switch my monitor because I'm not in the monitor in the house, which is a 2560 by 1440 panel. And then we'll just go in, make sure that, well, <laughs> in this case, all the settings are maxed out, cause why not? Push this computer to its limits. Um, actually, I'll leave VSync off. I'm kind of curious to see what kind of frame rate this thing will get. And look at that, we're still hitting the 300 FPS cap of this game engine, which doesn't exactly require much to hit that. So, you know, here we go. GPU's utilization is around 50 to 60% at the moment. Sometimes it dips a little lower, but here we go. I can really turn this mouse sensitivity up. It's really not that sensitive at all. But there we go. Let's see if I can turn that up real quick. It is really not that sensitive of a mouse in this game. Of course, it probably doesn't help the fact that I have it set up very sensitive in XP to begin with. Yeah, there we go. That's much better. Hello, and again, welcome to the Aperture Science Computer Aided Enrichment Center. We hope your brief detention in the relaxation vault has been a pleasant one. Your specimen has been processed, and we are now ready to begin the test proper. Before we start, however, keep in mind that although fun and learning are the primary goals of all enrichment center activities, serious injuries may occur for your own safety and the safety of others. Please refrain from the portal will And even doing the portal transitions, we only dip down into the 240 FPS range and about 75% GPU load with everything maxed out completely at 1080p. So yeah, this computer, truly overkill. <laughs> it's just you don't need this to play Portal. You absolutely do not. Um, why would you? <laughs> if you have the ability to. Anyways, you've seen Portal. I'm not going to play this whole game, obviously, but it's a lot of fun. And yes, this runs on XP, but that's not a surprise. Can't alt have four out of this game, so of course I got to do that. But of course, that's not the only thing that this computer can run. You can also do Need for Speed Pro Street, so I'll open that up. See if we can skip past this here. Now there's gonna be some copyrighted music, so I'm gonna to have to quickly turn it down. There we go. It's not loud enough to which it's going to cause a copyright strike. So now we can go into the well, not the quit option. That would be the best thing to do, I guess. But let's go over to our map and let's head to Battle Machine. Skip this cutscene because I don't need to worry about that. I've already played this game, but I love it that much because I'll have a lot of nostalgia for it. I played it back in the day on the PlayStation 2, and then I later got the Xbox 360 version, and I've had an absolute blast. This, in my opinion, is one of the best Need for Speed games they've made. Obviously, it's closed course. It's not like uh, Carbon where it was an open world kind of game, but, you know, hey, to each their own, right? So let's do this time trial real quick. Okay. Races have a ton of get out of here, stupid moth. Unfortunately, I can't play the soundtrack. This game is an excellent soundtrack. I love it. I have a lot of nostalgia for the songs. So, anyways, I have it capped at 60 FPS as well, because this game will run up to several hundreds of FPS if I'm not careful, and that will break the game physics, so I can't do that. This game uh, originally ran at 30 FPS on console anyway, so 60 is plenty. And all, this, all the settings are obviously maxed out. Whoops, there is some light damage. That was one of the aspects of this game. You know what? Let's restart. Whoops. Uh, don't want to do that. It's probably going to still have the light damage on there since I just inflicted that. That's kind of the aspect of this game. So, whoopsies. <laughs> but this is Battle Machine, so the cars will automatically fix themselves. You don't have to worry about it. I think. I just don't remember if it was... Uh, after the race is done, or if you can just restart and have it fix itself automatically. It's been so long since I've played this game. There's a 
front-wheel drive car, so I gotta be a little careful. They're a little interesting to control. I think was it N for nitrous, yep. here. Well, a little overboard here on the keyboard controls, but that's half the fun. This game is trying to get through the challenges because this game actually has quite good handling. I right, draft him. Let's go. I right, send it. Heck yeah. Correct. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> I suck at the keyboard. I would be much more accurate if I had a controller, because that's what I remember using was the 360 controller for the vast majority of this game. I still actually have the Xbox 360 version. I actually digitally got that way back in the day. So, glad I bought it when I was still able to. Oop. here. Ooh, under a minute. Let's go. Man, I'm getting a little better with the keyboard. There's a little bit of latency with the steering. That I have to get used to every single time I play this game, but man, is it surprisingly fun. It aged really well, in my opinion. I also need to get a copy of Need for Speed Shift, because that also ran on Windows XP. And that was also a really fun game back on the 360 and PlayStation 3. I distinctly remember that game. Uh, played it back in the whoops. <laughs> played it back in the day on my dad's PlayStation 3, and it was a lot of fun despite the frame rate problems that that version of the game had. Just a slight oops used with the damage there. It'll be fine. It's just back the machine. They're gonna cover it. It's fine. Don't worry about it. I should have saved one of my nitruses, but that's okay. <laughs> and there we go. Good deal. So yeah, that's Need for Speed Pro Street. A lot of fun. I'm so glad I have this game because, like, oh my gosh, it's a lot of fun to play. And, of course, there's some other games, too, that I can play. Uh, let me see if Halo requires the CD. Ah, dang it, it does. I don't have it optical drive obviously hooked up at the moment but one that is really impressive and it's going to show you what this computer is truly capable of is the last DirectX 9 version of Beamin G drive 0.4.0.6 which is extremely old by this point I'm sure obviously alas my copy right now is 32 bit so I am inherently limited but it still does start up and run it mentions that I need to have 64 bit which is obvious <laughs> 64-bit system is recommended. Well, yeah, I'm running a 64-bit system. <laughs> and it only sees 4 gigabytes of RAM, because, again, this is a 32-bit game, so that's the most that this process will ever see. But let's go to a free roam map. Let's just say we'll do East Coast USA. We'll let that load. And this is, well, East Coast USA. Now... What did I have this thing set to as far as its graphics settings? I know for a fact I had it set pretty high. Uh, it's currently running in a window, so it's not 1920 by 1080. I also have the frame rate capped at 60, of course. I also turned on dynamic reflection because I figure this GTX 780 should be able to handle it. And yeah, here we are. It's not great with the performance. Oh God, that was some stutter. It's not perfect. This is obviously a very rough, very early version of the game, but I mean, heck, here we go. It's Beam and G Drive. <laughs> Anybody remember those engine sounds? God, that brings back a lot of nostalgia for me. I distinctly remember playing 0 0.4 a lot back in the day, but I only had access to 
my Lenovo G780, which at the time uh, had only the integrated Intel HD 4000 GPU. So I didn't have the ability to crank the settings up like I do here with the dynamic reflections and everything, which is likely the reason why my frame rate is so awful right now. So I could probably turn the dynamic reflections down a bit and that'll probably help with my frame right here. And it's also because we're running a 32-bit game, so we're inherently limited as to what we have access to. But for what it is, man, you have to give some credit. This game, it's, it's come a long way. Should find some of the old mods. I gotta find like the old Balaz and the, uh, God, was it the, uh, frick, I forget all the mods I used to have back in the day. There was actually a really fun, like, drag truck that had, like, 5,000 horsepower that was just so ridiculous. It was hilarious to drive. Uh, but I think that was back in the days when BMG was in, like, 0 0.2 or something. So it was, like, super, super early BMG drive. But I remember supporting their game way back when. I bought a license before they were on, they were on Steam, even. So I have a lot of nostalgia for this game and its mods and the forums, everything like that. I might not have posted, I might not have done a whole heck of a lot, but trust me, I was there in the beginning. And I bought a license before they went on Steam, so I'm one of the very, very early ones. <laughs> so, yeah, this game has come a long, long way. Let's see if I can get a crash in here. Come on, press the treat. Dang it, I don't, well, you know what, that works. <laughs> So there we go. There's our crash and our lovely sub 60 FPS quality. Yeah, a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> if only there was newer versions I could run on Windows XP, but I think I'd have to step up to Vista for that in order to get access to the DirectX 10 build. Um, I think the last DirectX 10 build will still run on Windows Vista. I could be wrong on that. I'll have to see if I can find a copy of that online somewhere. Uh, by that point, they were on Steam, so it might be a little hard to get access to it, especially considering the fact that Vista also doesn't have access to uh, Steam repositories anymore. So it may just be that I'll have to run uh, Windows 7 on this computer, or I guess I'll just have to cough it up and deal with Windows 10 and 11 or whatever. But yeah, there's BeamNG Drive. I just need a 64-bit copy of that, since that would definitely help out with the performance. Uh, and then online, I managed to find a copy of GTA 4, the complete edition. It was the original uh, release of it that was on disc that required the use of uh, Games for Windows Live, but that got patched out and obviously doesn't exist anymore, and neither does Securom, so it's all been stuff that's defeated in this particular copy that I have here with no icon on the shortcut. And unfortunately, the version that I have, it starts up with the disclaimers in Russian, but aside from that, it actually works on this hardware, and it works reasonably well. So once we get past all the Cyrillic text here... <laughs> yes, I own this game legitimately, so, you know, Rockstar ain't losing any money by me showing this. I own the legitimate copy version. Actually, I own the game way back when the Steam version still required Securom, so that's how old I've been an owner of GTA 4 legitimately, so they can go suck it. <laughs> so let's go ahead, we'll set it to 1080p. All the other settings are fine, probably. Um, yeah, those all are fine, so we'll hop in the game here. Turn the sound back up a little bit. Of course, since we're on an SSD, this should load really fast. There we go. Just like a modern computer, it loads the game pretty much instantaneously. Well, not really, but close enough to. And let's go ahead and head outside here. As you can see, there's quite a bit of CPU load going on. So... It's definitely the case where you want a high clock speed processor. It doesn't really utilize that many cores. It just needs the efficient IPC and clock speed. And that was quite the dip there. Holy. All right, there we go. So now we can go ahead and run around Liberty City. And we don't have really any issues here. We're using about one gig of VRAM, just over one gig of VRAM. So you definitely would want a two gigabyte or actually, I guess I should be more specific. Um, you need at least a 1.28 gigabyte video card to max out this game at 1080p. Uh, something like the GTX, I think 400 and 500 series have that weird VRAM specification. More realistically, you'd probably have cards in the neighborhood that have like 
one gig, 1.5 gigs, or two gigs of VRAM, or even three in this case, because this has a 384-bit memory bus. So that only makes sense it has three gigs of VRAM. But uh, yeah, it's GTA 4. It runs pretty well. You know, just don't max out the sliders, and you're totally, you're totally cooking with gas right now. And uh, I need to mod the game to where I can allow it to use up to four gigabytes of system RAM versus just two, because, well, I have the RAM just killing in here that I could definitely make more use of so the game runs more smoothly. So I got to apply that mod. But other than that, uh, little notepad switcheroo thing, uh, that game runs very well. I'll put that shortcut back. So I'm going to get some other games going. As you can see, I've got a copy of Doom 3 here, which I pulled from the internet archive. I also tried to get a copy of Tomb Raider 2013 running, but I think unfortunately that game requires Steam as I wasn't able to get it to work obviously. <laughs> and I got Battlefield 1942 and Bad Company 2 on here and Mass Effect 2 and got so many great games. I even want to install a couple of those uh, Bejeweled games so I can play those. also have a copy of Office 2007 just in the event that I need to use it for something. I have an access uh, or I have access to it. So Maybe I'll upgrade that to 2010 if I care enough. <laughs> and I also have a modern web browser on here. I have MyPal with the Quantum Rendering Engine. So I'll open that up real quick. I don't have internet access currently working, but you can kind of see some of the things I've been going through to try to get stuff running on this machine. And it works quite well. Still browses the internet. Obviously, I have to put the disclaimer here because if I show something with Windows XP on the internet, I have to stress... Yes, I am fully aware of what I'm doing. This does not have an antivirus, and I am fully aware that my machine is unprotected on the internet. So yes, you do not need to procrastinate to me in the comments section saying, oh my God, you're taking Windows XP on the internet. Yes, I'm aware of all the risks. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> anyway, so with that having been said, um, I also have a copy of Paint.net on here. It's not the newest one that XP officially ran, uh, but it's pretty close to 3.5, and it's got the same user interface as the newer versions anyway, and it's gonna do pretty much all the same things that the newer versions for the most part can do obviously with hardware acceleration being something that is more refined on the newer version but yeah there you go and i almost forgot to show uh half-life 2 and well cs source and such uh well really i mean you could probably check those out for yourself if you really cared to uh <laughs> don't need to show those there half-life 2 has been seen numerous amounts of times as it is but yeah, that's pretty much what there is to say. I'll just end with NVIDIA control panel here, which really hasn't changed at all. <laughs> so, you know, here you go. Version 368.81. That's the same driver that is used with the Maxwell cards as well. And uh, you have to hack those, unfortunately, to add uh, further Maxwell support. But besides that, it's the same driver. So there we have it. I mean, what more can I say? It's the ultimate Windows XP computer and its origins and... Uh, it's awesome. I absolutely love this machine, and I absolutely love what I'm able to do with it. This is truly something that would really have been insane back in the day. Nobody would have ever thought to run XP on something like this. Like, you would have at the very least run Windows 7 on hardware like this. There's no reason to run XP. But nowadays, the tables and the tides kind of shifted a bit, and so it really doesn't matter, I guess, as much. I mean, it wouldn't matter to me. I don't really care. <laughs> I just, I don't run anyway, because that's just the kind of idiot that I am. But besides that, um, no, this machine is a passion project of mine that I really want to put together, and I'm really having a lot of fun in uh, putting together. And I hope that you all enjoyed being able to see the demonstrations of this machine, and I hope that the hardware in time can be utilized for certain videos on my channel even, and uh, hopefully I can make it look pretty, and hopefully you all will enjoy all that stuff along the way. So hopefully you like what you saw in this video. And if you did, well then you know what to press. If you didn't like it so much, well then you also know what to press. I would also get subscribed down below, somewhere down there. I do upload rather infrequently. And if you wanna see some more updates on this computer as it progresses in its design or upgrades, or you wanna just see it used for future game demonstrations or hardware benchmarking for when it's applicable, uh, you'll obviously want to stick around for that. But with that, I'm going to get out of here. I appreciate you all coming to watch this video, and I'll hopefully see you all in the next one. Mm -hmm.